Good afternoon. I'm Alexander Sklo. I will moderate this session, net zero and carbon removal. So welcome to the audience and to the speakers. So we have five speakers here, and the first one is Gregory Trencher. Good luck. Gregory is from the Kyoto University Graduate School of Global Environmental Studies. So yeah, I'll be presenting on um, the net zero pathways for um, four oil majors. Two of these are from the US and two of these are from Europe. Um, my sidekick is um, in, a, uh, in another session right now. So he's a pretty uh, busy guy. He's, I think, physically stretched right now. So um, the oil majors. So um, they're very important to have involved in the energy transition, as we know. But historically, um, that has not been the case. They've been working, if anything, to impede the transition. There's been a whole bunch of research about this. Um, so some of the, you know, the confirmed um, uh, acts to sort of delay the transition, for example, have been by spreading disinformation, by uh, withholding their spending on renewables, or by um, lobbying against climate uh, policies. However, over the, first, uh, over the past few years, these, these same oil majors have sort of started to brand themselves as being part of the solution, has been now um, working towards the goal of uh, reaching net uh, zero. They give the impression their websites are so green and so, so sustainable, it gives the impression of being sort of, you know, born again transition evangelists that are no longer involved in the dirty business of um, pumping up oil and gas, which we know that they still do. So um, my research is uh, looking at this same um, uh, four here, and the objective is to sort of um, to unpack their um, so-called uh, uh, net zero strategies and to compare them. And um, I have uh, a set of three questions. So first of all, what are the, you know, the similarities and the differences um, regarding their objectives for 2050? Um, and do their plans include the intention to downscale the supply of fossil fuel? And also um, the second point is about offsets. So um, do they plan to use offsets as a mean of um, reaching the net zero target? Um, so very quickly, so it's mainly a qualitative uh, study um, and I, take, I, I collect a huge amount of data and I try to systematically organize it around three indicators which I'll present on the next slide. But I do try and include some quantitative information and that relates mainly to the uh, offsets. And so I collect information on offsets. Um, the major source is um, from these uh, registries here which basically um, tell the public um, uh, if a carbon credit has been retired and what particular project that belongs to and what year that was retired from and what the vintage year was. So in other words, what the year of um, the climate benefit was. So I try and use that data as much as possible. Um, there's been a lot of uh, previous research that's looked at the um, transition activity of the oil majors and um, lots of people, myself included, have developed lots and lots of indicators. And um, some of them, for example, the, the recent work has looked at the presence of net zero targets. But other people, for example, have looked at, you know, the traditional environmental ones like, you know, annual uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, a lot of scholars look at their investments in renew renewable energy, which we know are still just a side business. And um, also there are fossil fuel production. So, um, so a lot of the scholarship focuses on renewable energy. But we know that this is just um, one part of the transition. The more important uh, question that we're all interested here at this conference is what are they doing with their core business which is fossil fuels so that's where um my uh, research really focuses on so i um uh work with just very uh simple um triple set of indicators this is like a triple litmus, litmus test that um i think leads to a very clear uh conclusion of whether or not they're um, pursuing a transition pathway or not the first one is um does the um, uh, plan for 2050, does that include uh, scope three emissions or not? If it doesn't include scope, scope three, that means that it does not include the carbon that's embedded in the fossil fuel products. So in other words, when that's burnt, that's not counted. Um, so that's a big difference between the majors already. And then in terms of um, uh, tackling the supply of fossil fuels, um, not, only the, not only the supply of uh, self-produced fossil fuels, but also the supply of uh, fossil fuels that are produced by third parties that are then sold by that major. This is a very, very important question um, that previous research has not really looked at. And finally, um, are offsets going to be used to reach the net zero target? Most scholarship, myself included, haven't looked at this before. So this is kind of the novelty of my study. Um, so, uh, a quick little crash course in offsets. We don't have time to go into the details, but there are different types. We have, you know, the, um, the nature-based solutions up here, and then we have the technology-based solutions down here. But I want you to pay attention, especially to the red and green, which is the, um, the uh, avoidance-based and the, um, uh, the removal. So basically, um, I'm, not, I'm not sort of trying to promote offsets here, but basically, um, the, the most kind of benign type, okay, <laughs> the most benign type, 
are kind of those that tackle um, that draw down CO2 directly from the atmosphere. If we're going to use offsets, that will, that's what we want to see happening. And because forests only offer like a short-term solution in terms of the global carbon cycle, a better solution is to put that CO2 back underground permanently with technological um, approaches such as BECs or DACs. Please try and remember that. The, the worst approach from a climate benefit perspective is these avoidance-based approaches, for example, saying, you know, protecting a forest and saying we're going to stop logging and therefore give us, we're going to produce a whole bunch of credits and then you can go and burn fossil fuels um, and that you can count that as carbon neutral because we've saved logging. That's those avoidance um, approaches are sort of um, regarded as low quality in terms of climate benefits. And the other important indicator is also the age. We want to sort of see carbon credits being recent. Um, and I've used like um, the, uh, the yardstick of um, 2016, which is um, used in the aviation offset scheme in Europe. So um, just to sum summarize this, basically, if we see credits that are avoidance based, if we see credits that are starting to be pretty old, you know, for example, above six years, that means we're looking at pretty crappy, uh, cheap, old stuff. You could consider this as a sub um, a subprime mortgage, for example. So um, let's go to the results. So um, I don't have time to go into the details here, but we can see looking at um, the scope three emissions, Chevron and ExxonMobil um, have conspicuously left that out of their um, net zero plans. All four majors market themselves as being pursuing a net zero goal, but there's a huge difference here regarding uh, the inclusion of scope three. Um, regarding the supply of fossil fuels, so um, BP actually have attracted a lot of attention recently by um, uh, fixing a goal to reduce their oil and gas production by 40%. A lot of people kind of got excited by it and said, oh, you know, they're tackling production. But what that doesn't take into account is this um, BP here, they actually um, sell more uh, oil and gas produced by other people than what they produce themselves. So they're basically saying they're going to reduce this part by 40%. They're leaving out this part from the equation. So this is not um, an adequate sort of um, solution to the supply problem, in my perspective. And Shell also um, is um, doing the same thing. Chevron and ExxonMobil, they both explicitly communicate in their shareholder communications that they're trying to increase their fossil fuel production. So um, coming back to this table here, so we see that um, none of the majors have a plan to tackle sales. And we only have limited action here regarding supply. Offsets, all the four majors are um, planning to use offsets to meet their 2050 targets. So I don't see any evidence here that um, a major could be um, considered as um, pursuing a transition regarding the criteria that I've set. So um, I'm going to try and jump in now into the offsets and, um, with the limited time I have and um, try and yeah, characterize this. So basically, ideally, I would go to the registries where um, carbon offsets are disclosed to the public in terms of the volume of credits that are retired, in terms of the vintage of, that, of, the, of the credits. And I would use that. However, um, this big data gap. So basically, um, what I've done is decided to organize a database in terms of offset projects. So that means I go to the websites of BP, Shell, Chevron, and every time I see that they mention a particular um, offset project, I put that into the database. Then I go on to the public registries and I look and see if I can find that um, recorded or not. And all this stuff in orange is telling me that most of these projects that they tell the public that they're actually purchasing offsets from, they're not disclosing that activity. So there's a big data gap here. And then when we do, f um, and then I've classified these projects. And we, if you remember before, I said that avoidance based is kind of like that low quality type of offset. Um, BP especially and Chevron are using predominantly avoidance based projects. And um, Shell is kind of um, balanced. We don't see any technological based approaches to removal. There's not one, there's not one single project here. The last thing is the age issue. Um, the overall finding is that the vast majority of these pro projects are using age offsets. To give you a qualitative example, um, Shell has purchased a huge amount of offsets from a project in Indonesia, which is called the Kantangan Peatland Restoration Project. It's a, it's a red project, it's conservation. The idea is we're not gonna cut down the forests, we're gonna sell these credits to people. So they're, for example, um, shipping uh, LNG to Asia, calling that carbon neutral. But um, these credits are actually have a vintage of 2010. This is like you eating a pizza on Sunday to celebrate for your jog around the park 10 years ago because of the calories that burnt. <laughs> That's, um, this, that, this is what the majors are doing and they're doing this at a massive scale. And this, I find this extremely uh, worrying and um, I'd be pleased to explain in more detail. So if you look here at the blue in the pie here, all the blue is the so-called um, aged offset activity. Um, you notice that ExxonMobil didn't shop didn't show up in any of my graphs. ExxonMobil seems to be very silent regarding the use of offsets. So basically, um, 
are the majors transitioning? I had three indicators. Um, no, according to my analysis. Um, long story short, fossil fuel supply, Chevron Exxon is trying to increase the supply. BP and Shell are very cleverly sort of hiding their plans to um, um, increase the supply as well. Um, yes, and, um, and so there's a symbolic photograph of Mount Fuji with um, a shipment of uh, LNG. That's because Japan is actually one of the major consumers globally of this so-called um, carbon neutral uh, LNG. So um, as I've showed you um, very quickly, the majority of these offset projects are avoidance based and they're involved in these age credits. So, and don't forget that of all the offsets types that exist, these offer the most doubtful climate benefits. So um, I think that this is evidence that the, authentic, the authenticity of the claims of net zero or carbon neutral are um, contestable. So sorry I had to rush through 100 miles an hour. I'll be very pleased to um, give you uh, more details on the methods and everything. Um, a bit of a self-plug, sorry, this is the paper that we, um, a student of mine um, produced uh, in February this year that got um, a bit of attention. And so the paper I just presented to you now is kind of like a bit, it's inspired by this first paper, trying to fill in a few of the gaps and yeah, hopefully um, you get a bit of attention as well. So um, thank you very much. That my talk is just can carbon level technologies are compatible with managed decline of fossil fuels. I say, I guess it's many of you expecting, I will say no. Um, but my answer is probably yes and no. Uh, and I tried to find a right way answer to, to maybe like moving a little bit towards the yes. Um, so first of all, I'm going to try to understand the challenge of the decarbonization. So like, it's not like a you know, daunting challenge of decarbonization we are facing. So basically, we have three different approaches to how to achieve net zero uh, like energy systems. First is increasing the supply of the, the non-carbon energies, like, like renewable like energies or nuclear or maybe like bioenergies. And, and the second one is a demand side like an approach, like reducing the energy demands and increasing like energy efficiencies or save energy savings. But even though these like you know, combining two different approaches, there could be like you know there will be like you know zero emissions from some of the very hard to abate like sectors like steel, cement, or international aviations and shipping. So those kind of like you know, remaining emissions has to be offset by by CO two like removal like carbon dioxide removal. And so that's a basic like in a, like a basic picture of uh, the challenge we are facing decarbonizations. But anyway, the the consensus among the, the I think us is like you know, we need to reduce the CO uh, fossil fuel uh, use as much as possible. Um, but I, I guess I guess this challenge is also quite difficult, and and I think so we don't need to actually comment I like, you know say much about that. But uh, there's uh, committed emissions from from existing and propose like energy infrastructures, which already exceeding, will be exceeding like, you know, 1.5 carbon budget. So it means like, you know, we need to have a premature uh, retirement of coal power plants or other any like, you know, energy infrastructures. But at the same time, this challenge of like, you know, like in the phasing out is also extremely difficult because of the like, you know, carbon low green, and not only about infrastructure, but also like technological or behavioral lock greens it's interlocking each other. So it's it's not about technical like challenges, but a more political or economical challenges. Um, so that's that's the background of like why the some how like you know carbon removal technologies come into into the to the prey of the game of the politics of decarbonizations. But I, I think in my view, I think there are kind of like a contradictory discourse around this carbon removal, uh, CDL. So the one hand, IPCC, other like an IEA, like, you know, I, like talking like, you know, basically like you pointed out, the CDL as a necessity for the offsetting the zero emissions, emissions from hard to abate sectors. But on the other hand, there's a lot of like you know, criticisms and concerns among partic like particularly among the NGOs as, you know, the CDL could be used and it is using actually, as, as Gregory talked about, as excuse to avoiding the necessary like, emission reductions and hence and perpetuating the status quo of fossil fuel. So how come to these two different, like, you know, very com like, you know, competing, like, contradictory discos come into to, to portal and CDL? How we could make sense of these, like, in a contradictory discos? And, and to understand of this, like, in you know, a contradictory, I think that looking back to, to the history of the CCS might be, like, you know, beneficial, like, and helpful to understand. And and then CCS is appear has a very, like, you know, like attracted a lot of, like, you know, political, like, an appeal among particular industry sect, like, you know, actors. This is because the nature of the CCS as a non-disruptable and, and 
endopipe technologies, which allows the like continuous well, users of fossil fuel while maintaining, like you know, while mitigating CO2 emissions. So it, it is kind of like, like in a portrait as a programmatic like a compromise, resolving that is like in a political dilemma arising from the like carbon low cream. But when you look at like in the history, of course we know CCS is stagnated as it's not with the cancelling of the demonstration projects, which like you know the promise of CCS is in some way like you know we could say it's failed. And but when we look at the uh, the, the discourse of how the CCS, like in the like in the industry use the CCS, they use like in a like in a bridging technology uh, metaphor and try to present the CCS as sort of like you know temporary solutions and and by just just buying time until the better options um, you know become available and of course we know this is a this bridge like a bridge framing is this flawed uh, like an argument because adding CCS into like in you know, a with, with the coal power plant or gas power plant actually it's it's it's, it's making more difficult to, to avoid like you know moving away from the like you know uh, fossil fuel lock-in and so it is actually increasing the risk of the 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 enforcing of carbon locking, and then then the failed promises of CCS, CCS actually you know it's just basically like you know like in you know, a delaying the actions and, and of urgent actions of using CO two emissions. And um, on the other hand, uh, the criticism that around the CDL it's a little bit different, and then it's I think it's. The, the, it's fair to say there are a few, like you know, like in you know, concerns, like in you know, serious concerns among the like you know the scholars about like you know the C CDL is sort of creating like you know, mitigation deterrence or the, or some other people call like moral hazards, and this is like in a, like in a popularized by by the, the Duncan McCrudden from the Lancaster Universities, and it's these concerns originatory from the debate over the solar geoengineering or solar radiation management, and then solarization management is is a sort of idea to not uh, without reducing CO2 emissions and releasing the particles and reflecting particles to the atmosphere, and by doing so quickly, like you know, the stop like an you know, increase of the global temperature. And then, because of this feature of the SRM, it's it's like you know, like famously called, like it is a cheap, fast, and an imperfect, like in you know, solutions. Mm -hmm. And and because of this, like in you know, a very controversial nature of the SRM, it's very severely criticized. And and one of the, I think the Jenny Stefan is very fierce criticism, uh, crit like critiques of SRM. And I am very also the very worried about SRM. And and one of the reasons is because SRM has a real risk to be like used as undue substitution of, of mitigations, and and then because of the history of the SCDL and SRM was bumped like you know you like in a group together as an like you know the the rubric of the geoengineering. So so one of that's somehow way carry out to to the CDL. I call in debate on CDL and CDL considered to be like in a constitutional and your substitutions. But at the same time, also we look at like an earlier history, particularly controversy on over the role of the forest carbon sinks and like particularly inclusion of the CF activity in the Kyoto Protocol, which kind of like you know also the similar way of the argument say, you know using the the, the tertiary carbon sink as a sort of like an offsetting and perpetuating the status quo of the fossil carbon emissions. And then recently, then now like you know the the biological thing, particularly for alloforestation, reforestation is reframed as a CDL. And then it's pretty much the same, con like, you know, con like, you know, structures uh, continuing, like we, uh, the CDL actually has the, the actually the risk of the being used as undue substitution. And I think the, the Gregory pretty much clearly showed that's how it's, it's portrayed and used in a, in a net discourse discourse by um, fossil fuel companies. And, but I, I wanted to put, point it out, there is a cru crucial differences between CCS and CDR. And when you think about, like look at CCS, CCS mostly like, you know, considered to use retrofit or like, like equipped with, with a fossil fuel, like, you know, in, like infrastructure, like, like power camp, like coal power plants and, and, and a gas power plants. So this it is a CCS use is physically coupled with a fossil fuel infrastructure Fracture. So, which is, you know, by de, fa de facto, it's, it's, you know, the continuing, like, you know, the, uh, the fossil fuel use. 
But on the other hand, CDL, in principle, it's not like in a physically, like, you know, detached to the fossil fuel in infrastructure. So it's this nature of the physical decoupling actually make it possible to do CCS, a CDL can be used not to increasing like, our reliance on fossil fuel use. And, and then, so then perhaps we could a little bit think about it. Some hope that like, you know, maybe like, you know, I'm a bit of a too politically naive to think about like, you know, transforming like the fossil fuel company uh, industry to carbon uh, disposal industry. But uh, I think CDL can be the, the way to, to, you know, as function as a political middle ground for mitigating like in you know, a fossil fuel regime resistance. And then it's the reason why I think that there is a lot of the fossil fuel industries because they do have an extra like you know, engineering expertise for the geological storage. But also, also they have a capital asset, which could be in principle repurposed for the large scale project like for the CDL. And um, so, yeah, I, I think it, there's no like, you know, reason to think about in principle why not to like in you know, a pursuing future try to incentivize responsibly intensified the the pressuring uh to the the fossil fuel industry to transform into the fossil, uh, carbon disposal industries and so this is my last slide yeah so just put, like i'll say like you know the nasal target is normalize cdl as a mitigations and and there is continued debates about cdl whether they have a low or what um, but I think I would say this debate is nothing to do, uh, it's less to do with technology itself, but it's more with, with difficulty to breaking the fossil fuel lock in. Um, I, I would say CDL can be that kind of like, you know, to, uh, one way to actually to align the CDL uh, with, with the declining of fossil fuel. Um, sorry for that, a little bit like, you know, over time. So, but that's my talk. Thanks. Thank you, and uh, it's a pleasure to be with you guys uh, today. And I guess I'm, a, I'm a, a bit of an anomaly in this panel, this because uh, I guess uh, I'm coming from the world of working with governments, um, sort of supporting them and actually trying to move towards responsible policies and the regulatory and legal framework uh, to help accelerate the transition. Um, so I, I think it's a nice leeway because I think there is personally in terms of, you know, the the distraction and the proliferation of net really results in uh, because we're losing a focus on the first element, which is the reduction. Um, so, uh, yeah, so in terms of what we do, it's looking at, uh, as I mentioned, the policies, the fiscal regime, the regula regulatory system. And I'm going to focus my remarks on a missed opportunity, I think, in terms of helping this discourse, which is around the government's approval. Um, so, you know, through the last two days, we've been talking about, uh, you know, the known issue, which is the fact that with our limited carbon budget, we are well in excess of where we need to be. Uh, now, how do we rectify and tackle that? It requires a multi-pronged uh, approach. So both on the demand and uh, supply side, but also in terms of looking at it from the international uh, mechanisms as well as the national. Um, and, you know, when we talk about the national components, even that is, I think, being subsumed within net uh, targets. Uh, so, you know, now we're hearing about uh, not just country targets, net 2050, but industry targets within national components, but again, without very uh, a lot granularity. What are the details behind this? Um, and I think I'm actually going to talk even much more getting into the specifics of projects. And so this is a, against a backdrop of the reality being, you know, on average, we have about 90 to $100 billion of investments continuing every year. So as we've heard, you know, from Christoph and others, uh, there's a massive gap in terms of the activity that's being approved and the investments in these decisions. So really and truly a renewed uh, regulatory focus on the approval component at the project level is, I believe, a huge opportunity uh, that really requires us to take a much more, a different approach to it. Um, and again, looking at what does net zero mean in terms of uh, at a project level. Uh, why the project? Why the approval? Um, so again, we're uh, hopefully in this uh, audience know um, 
the project life cycle. And quite often we uh, go to the numbers around the projects that have been sanctioned. So this is actually the investment decisions. But there are a lot of key milestones that occur before that. Uh, yes, you have the discovery, but critically, you know, in terms of it's the government's approval for those investments, uh, the decisions that are being made. And prior to any actual investment being uh, proceeded by companies, uh, companies need to submit to government in every single country, in every single regime, an approval process. They need to come to the government and say, these are my plans for developing these discoveries, this resource. And that, you, that must, or should I say, cover all, the entire suite of factors. So the strategic, the technical, the economic, the social, and the environmental. Um, critically, no prudent company would, nor do they actually increase investment or activity uh, unless they have that government approval. Uh, now, the reason this approval process is so important is because it sets the stage for everything that happens on a field and an investment, including down to how decommissioning will be treated. And again, there are elements of risks with stranded assets on how decommissioning will be funded. And in many countries, there is zero regulatory systems for that. So again, it's a huge risk when we're, th we're thinking about a just and equitable transition. Um, so uh, I believe it's a critical tool for effective regulation of, of greenhouse gases. And here I'm saying greenhouse gases, not CO2 or CO2 equivalent, the whole suite of them. So typically, uh, when uh, an FDP, field development plan, or a plan of development, POD as it's called in some jurisdictions, are submitted, these are the typical sort of contents that are included. So this is the, you know, after a multi-year process of two to three years of evaluation at a specific asset level. Uh, one of the requirements is, uh, you know, uh, reports and analysis under the HSE, health, safety, uh, and environmental factors. You know, I would make the argument that there should be clear requirements for any associated greenhouse gas management plan. Uh, now, it, you know, what are some of the things that could be included in that? Clearly, we need to have a view on what is the asset level view of uh, greenhouse gas emissions from that specific project, you know, including how that has come about, what's the assessment methodology uh, and benchmarking against uh, similar projects. Uh, really important, small decisions on design make a huge difference in terms of how assets are operated and what the greenhouse gas footprint of those assets are. It's uh, things around flaring, venting, methane leakage, you know, these are typical uh, issues of which 70% of them can be avoided with known technology existing processes. These very small things that can be done at this point in time to help in terms of minimizing it um, going forward. Again, there should be an assessment of the risk to the value of the asset from carbon pricing, and that can come about in various ways, um, as well as an indication of how the company uh, intends to manage, measure, report uh, greenhouse gas over the entirety of the project's life cycle. You know, and I would argue there needs to be a credible plan for the project to be net zero. So again, this is at an asset level. What do I mean by that? Um, and bear in mind, I also share healthy skepticism around the use of net zero, as I mentioned. So the first step is really about ensuring that any asset is being done at the lowest possible greenhouse gas emission. So quite often, you know, as we all know in this room, averages hide a lot. There is a huge range of variability and performance of greenhouse gas um, at the asset level. Uh, and it depends very much even in terms of what type of uh, is what type of asset we're looking at, onshore, offshore, you know, light, heavy, sweet, sour, etc. So again, you know, and we've heard uh, there's a lot of good work now going in terms of increasing the transparency of this, but there's very little in terms of what is the projected uh, greenhouse gas footprint for a new project. Um, and again, a lot can be done so that they can operate at the best in class. And I think that should be the default position. 
any sort of is any development going forward we shouldn't be talking about the industry average it should be done at the best in class and what are the measures being put in place to ensure it is near zero i mean these developments cannot be zero by default but how can we get there uh, near zero in terms of today and I would argue again that the management plan should include carbon removal options, as we heard from, from others uh, uh, this, this afternoon. So in terms of what that entails, you know, this is just sort of an, an indication of what that would look like. So in terms of if you were to look at a, a typical similar project in terms of the footprint, and the purple bars are sort of like taking through those the steps of the first um, stage, which is how do you get, given you're approving a project today, uh, what is possible in terms and what are your plans to have that be done at the lowest possible? So in terms of, you know, some of the issues there in addition to the flaring, etc., the efficiency that was mentioned, um, you know, the electrification of these uh, operations. And of course, there will be unavoidable um, emissions from a project that's uh, being developed. And then here we come in terms of the use of offsets. Again, offsets are fraught with a lot of uh, issues, uh, difficulties, challenges around them, as uh, have been alluded to. Uh, but I think here, again, we need to, to possibly think about how we can leverage it so that the offsets here are used and are really tangible and deliver benefits. So in particular for developing countries, you know, we need to ask the questions of how are offsets actually going to be used? Are they going to be via purchasing offset, you know, in terms of six, seven years, as we saw from the previous speaker? Or is it going to be in real removal? Um, and where is it going to happen? Quite often it's done at the company level. Uh, what happens when assets are sold, uh, transferred? How are, how are those offsets being uh, treated? It's not necessarily tied to the, um, to the asset. If we were to use that with um, uh, requiring developments to be done in country, uh, that may be a good way to leverage it so that you have physical um, delivery in country. So in wrapping up, you know, uh, the potential for net zero projects uh, could be an, an indispensable tool. I think the critical thing here is not looking at this from the broader perspective, but the specific asset, the specific project, and getting into the details and requiring transparency. Um, and again, the last piece is, you know, the support to do this is a critical need. Uh, th these are very complex issues and quite often uh, y the government's review of this needs to be done in a way that is, um, yes, that it's not a check in a box exercise and a, a simple approval. You do need to have the adequate technical review of these types of uh, uh, approval systems so that you're, you're enabling this to happen. Yeah, thanks very much. So I'm, I'm Kathy Mulvey. I direct the fossil fuel company accountability campaign at the Union of Concerned Scientists, which is a US-based, science-based advocacy organization. And I want to talk about some burning questions about net zero and fossil fuel company accountability through the lens of internal corporate documents that were uh, released earlier this month by the US House Oversight and Reform Committee pursuant to its investigation of fossil fuel company disinformation on climate change. So um, I did want to crowdsource um, from you all some ideas near the end of this two-day conference uh, about how we address and prevent greenwashing by the fossil fuel industry. So if you want to go to that link, I will figure out how to share the results afterwards. I'm not sure I have that quite planned out, but we'll get there. Um, so this congressional, if folks have the, the code there, I should have put the QR there, but um, this congressional investigation was launched a year ago. Um, it's involved a, a series of hearings, including with the CEOs of the same four companies that, that Gregory uh, covered in his, his study. And uh, they have issued subpoenas um, 
since the the launch of the investigation um as they as the companies were not as responsive as they should have been and these actually focus on the period since the paris agreement and the and during the rise of the net zero claims and and pledges and so hundreds of pages of documents were released and there are more to come next month um so essentially one thing that we see is that uh, all of these companies engage in, in greenwashing and the European companies get credit for including their scope three emissions in their net zero pledges, um, but they actually still individualize the problem. BP, of course, notoriously invented the concept of the, of the carbon footprint uh, and has this calculator on its website now, um, but BP is not actually reorienting itself toward clean, renewable energy. And even as it touts um, CCS as the centerpiece of its net zero plans, this um, April 2016 internal memo reveals how the company views uh, carbon capture and storage internally. So it has the potential to enable the full use of fossil fuels across the energy transition and beyond. And I should say this annotated version of the documents is uh, courtesy of Kurt Davies of the Climate Investigations Center. So ExxonMobil also features CCS and uh, uh, algae biofuels in its ad campaigns. And here's an example of an ad that you might have seen. It's part of a campaign that the company has spent $68 million on while at the same time, only pledging to spend $300 million on R&D for this technology. And the documents released to the Oversight Committee um, show that ExxonMobil had to curb the enthusiasm of its ad agency, BBDO, um, and make it clear that the solution is more future focused. And of course, ExxonMobil is counting on emissions cuts in the 2040 to 2050 range and not in the crucial decade between now and, and 20, or less than a decade between now and 2030. Um, so one thing I, I looked at is what was happening at this time, November 2016. Uh, um, well, uh, uh, there was a major shift in the US political landscape. Um, and it was also the deadline for submission of shareholder proposals for the for consideration at ExxonMobil's 2017 annual shareholders meeting. Um, and you know, I think at this time of political change, one might presume that investors would no longer be expecting U.S. government policy action and and thinking they needed to step it up. And indeed. Um, in May 2017, the first time a climate-related shareholder proposal ever won a majority at ExxonMobil by a two-to-one margin, um, Exxon shareholders called on the company to report on how Paris-aligned policies would affect its its strategies. Um, so, you know, this this breakthrough laid the groundwork for mounting investor pressure on ExxonMobil that, of course, culminated in 2021 with a revolt um, and the ousting of, of three board members and, and sort of coalesced an expectation among the um, shareholder community that focuses on environment, social and government governance issues that, that major oil and gas companies need to take responsibility for scope three emissions from burning their products. and. Uh, and aim to reduce those. So um, shifting gears a bit here, another form of greenwashing is a bait and switch really between um, scenarios and, weasel, and using weasel words like pledges, aims, and ambitions. And Shell um, you know, released its sky scenario with some fanfare um, and presents it as, as Paris aligned, um, but it's actually so misleading that they have to really carefully train their spokespeople not to say explicitly what they really secretly hope all of us will think, which is that this is a business plan. Um, so this is internal messaging guidance um, for Shell around net zero from January of 2020. 
And you'll see they want to make sure that spokespeople are presenting it as a goal for society, not a target for Shell, and that there's no immediate plans to move to a net zero emissions portfolio over an investment horizon of 10 to, of, over Shell's investment horizon of 10 to 20 years. Now, some context here that's interesting in uh, April of 2019, the uh, Dutch organization Friends of the Earth Milieu Defense um, sued Shell, calling on the company to um, cut its greenhouse gas emissions in line with the Paris Agreement. And um, Shell and other major oil and gas companies are acutely aware of liability and litigation risks associated with their misleading and, and deceptive claims. So both misrepresenting the scale and scope of their corporate climate action or com or inadvertently committing the company to climate action that it doesn't intend to take. Um, so this is, is from that same in, um, messaging training where you can see Shell's being very careful um, to avoid content or use balanced, complete, and accurate content and messages to avoid litigation risks. So our last example um, is related to the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative, which was launched at, at the Par in Paris in 2015. ExxonMobil and Chevron joined in September of 2018. And this um, is from an ExxonMobil uh, briefing memo for an OGCI meeting in uh, it, the memos from April, um, sorry, August of 2019. And you can see they developed their plans in consultation with Chevron. Um, and this lays bare, really, oh, sorry, the uh, desire to pay lip service to Paris while actually not backing up its support with policy advocacy. Um, so you can see, you know, we don't want to talk about Paris in a way that would commit us to advocate for it. So here, the context is a rising call from the investor community for companies to align their climate policy advocacy with their stated positions. Um, and uh, that began in Europe. Um, that was uh, in October of 2018 with shareholder proposals in the spring of 2019. And U.S. non-governmental organizations um, picked this up in the, an emerging civil society, society expectation. Um, you, it, our organization, Union of Concerned Scientists, and other major um, environmental and, and public interest organizations took out a full-page ad in the New York Times in October of 2019, calling on the U.S. business community to align its policy advocacy with stated company positions and actually actively advocate for positions that it, that they claim to support and to allocate their funding accordingly as well for political spending and their support to um, lobbying and advocacy groups. So uh, essentially uh, what we see here is that the this concerted advocacy from affected communities, um, elected representatives, shareholders, and through uh, litigation is really pushing um, so pushing on net zero. And we've heard a lot here about transparency. Um, and uh, um, a few things to think about is um, we what one part of the antidote here is mandatory and standardized disclosures. And you know, this is necessary, but not sufficient. But it's clear that, that we need from these companies their full range of emissions, scope one, scope two, and scope three, the role that they expect offsets to play in their emissions reductions plans, um, their actual clean energy and renewable energy investments, their direct and indirect political activity and what they spend on that, uh, their climate impacts on communities, and their climate-related public relations spending. So those are some of the provisions that ought to be in um, in mandatory disclosures, such as, what, such as what the Securities and Exchange Commission is pursuing in the US and facing a lot of blowback. Um, thank you. Naomi Klein, the author and uh, journalist, came to Australia in 2015 and she remarked that in Australia it's impossible to tell where the coal industry ends and the federal government begins. So it, 
it's a fairly generous assessment, in my opinion, because actually in Australia it's impossible to tell where the gas and coal industry begins, ends, sorry, and where the federal government begins. And the reason why I mention that straight up, uh, st- straight off the bat is because in Australia, uh, this is sort of a beautiful culmination of what the other speakers have been talking about, government and industry are so inextricably and symbiotically linked that if I talk about fossil fuel expansion in Australia, you you know that it's one is shorthand for the other. They're basically synonymous. So Australia is, uh, I don't know if you know the third largest exporter of fossil fuels in the world. If you count our global contributions from exports, uh, it's about a 7% contribution to global emissions. So it's significant. Um, To maintain and protect what I would say is a fairly dubious honour, the Australian government carries out a practice that in our research we have termed state-sponsored greenwash. So industry is often, uh, you know, credited with promoting CCS, carbon neutral gas. In Australia, actually, it's the government who is as deeply involved, if if not more so, um, in carrying out this activity. So just for background, in Australia, we've just had an election. It was called a green slide election because the the incumbent, um, you know, completely unambitious um, climate government was voted out um, in favour of a more nominally ambitious um, government. Um, (laughs) uh, And accordingly, the Australian government, uh, soon after it was elected, updated its Paris, our Paris target. So we're now... 43% um, reduction on 2005 levels by 2030. Um, Previously, it was 26 to 28%. So it's not huge, but it's better. Um, Unfortunately, despite this sort of nominal increase in ambition, the, the, the new government remains just as committed to fossil fuel expansion as the previous government did. So that comes in the form of, you know, fast tracking these these approval projects that you were talking about. But we also subsidise the industry to the tune of about $10 billion every year. Uh, the industry contributes very little in terms of tax or royalties or employment to Australia. However, it does donate significantly to both major political parties, including the government that's just that's just been elected. Um, The gas industry dictates a lot of our policies. I won't go into that, but certainly they dictate our climate policy and the independent statutory body that's been appointed to advise the government on its, you know, increased ambition is led by former gas executives. So you can see that actually if you scratch below the surface, not a lot has changed in Australia except for a change of brand. What has changed is that now that we have increased climate ambition, the pressure to conceal that inherent contradiction in, you know, increased climate ambition and fossil fuel expansion has increased significantly. So the the temptation for greenwash by the new government and, and industry under the new government has also increased significantly. Of course, you see a, a similar contradiction globally, globally that you've mentioned in industry where uh, fossil fuel companies, you know, have a, a nominal support for climate action. They even support the Paris Agreement, but at the same time, they're lobbying governments strenuously to to increase and um, support and subsidise production. In Australia, and what we think is going to be um, increasingly common globally, is that the key to bridge the gap between this climate ambition and fossil fuel supply or, or fossil fuel expansion is an unlimited supply of carbon credits, regardless of the vintage. So in Australia, the government's plan to meet its climate target is not to reduce absolute emissions, uh, you know, through incentivising absolute reductions or regulating those more recalcitrant um, industries or, or, you know, facilities. It's literally to create an unlimited supply of carbon credits available to industry. And and when I say unlimited, we're up in the hundreds of millions so far that have already been generated. And I should just, I was getting so enthusiastic, I forgot to go to my first slide. This is Australia's updated NDC, looks great, says all the right things. What it doesn't tell you is that Australia actually has over a hundred new gas and coal projects in development. The offshore or the exported emissions from those 
as well as the domestic emissions, would be 1.7 billion tonnes every year. The onshore emissions alone would be 150 million tonnes every year. So obviously the participation in carbon markets by the fossil fuel industry is not new, as, as we've heard from some of our speakers. What is new is just how sophisticated the industry and government together are becoming um, with with this. So, you know, in the face of increased scrutiny, um, greenwashing claims, um, climate litigation, uh, government and industry know now that just buying carbon credits or paying someone to plant trees is no longer enough. Um, so as a result, they've become deeply involved in all aspects of carbon markets. So involved in the design of carbon credits, supply of carbon credits, and the demand of carbon credits. What's going to happen and what we see happening in Australia is that they're also becoming involved in the regulation of carbon credits. Um, this has largely been in the voluntary domain, but but in Australia is an excellent case study is in the way that this is becoming, um, I guess, baked into regulatory and compliance emissions reductions or emissions offsetting, um, offsetting schemes. So this is a, a focus of our work is basically the greenwashing of offsets. This, this is this, what we mean by state-sponsored greenwash. Um, th this includes the being involved in the supply of carbon credits. So in Australia, we nominally have like this government uh, regulated carbon credit scheme. So we have this independent statutory body that is tasked with administer like generating, administering and regulating all our carbon credits. Industries become involved in this scheme and they now generate offsets under this scheme for themselves to use, but also to sell to others. Um, uh, whether it's actually having projects themselves or in the case of Shell, actually buying up, you know, project developers. But we also now have industry designing these carbon credits with government um, and no, there is, I think, no more egregious example of this uh, in the, the way the Australian government invited fossil fuel industries to help design a carbon credit method for carbon capture and storage. So what I mean by that is a gas company can earn carbon credits for capturing a small amount of its reservoir CO2, just a fraction of its emissions. That gas company has these credits that are certified by government. The gas company can then sell those credits to another gas company to offset its emissions, and then the Australian government will certify that gas company as carbon neutral. So you have this sort of beautiful like life cycle of greenwash all kind of under the auspices of a government scheme and research by the Australia Institute has sort of documented on the basis of freedom of information uh, just how the government invited industry. Santos, having the first project registered, was, was instrumental in this scheme. So just to be clear, um, Australia's carbon credit scheme has not reduced emissions. It's a few years old. Uh, emissions from industry have actually increased. Uh, we see this globally. You know, 30 years of global carbon trading have not seen emissions reduced. They've increased. It's given industry social licence to continue operating, all while the literature is riddled, you know, regardless of vintage, um, with perverse outcomes, you know, trees burning down, trees not existing in the first place. Just really quickly, I'm going to skip over this, but this is an important point. Rather than abandoning the concept of offsetting, industry and government has just doubled down and said, actually, the carbon doesn't really matter. We generate these things called co-benefits when we make offsets, which is all the nice biodiversity benefits from planting trees or giving Indigenous people jobs. And that's where they're placing the em emphasis now. I've heard people in the industry not even refer to co-benefits anymore, but refer to them as, as core benefits. And it's actually incredibly clever because it makes it impossible to scrutinise the lack of carbon reduction in a carbon credit because if you do so, you're racist or you hate nature and you're attacking all these other good things. So I'm serious. It's it's incredibly sophisticated way of doing it and, and just keep an eye out for this. I was going to skip over that, but I just am so into it. Um, so just beyond the actual machinations of designing carbon credits, and I think this is the starkest example of state-sponsored greenwash our work shows, the Australian government has a scheme where it 
certifies fossil fuel companies as carbon neutral, <laughs> yeah, I know, um, and promotes them, okay, cool, as progressive climate leaders. And I'll just like literally offsetting the, the emissions from their offices and, and then they can be labelled as carbon neutral um, and, and climate leaders. So state-sponsored greenwash in Australia is not limited to carbon credits, but this is where the focus is lying in Australia and I think this is what's going to happen globally um, as, you know, scepticism around CCS remains and it's in the distant future. This is real-time greenwash hap happening now and governments increasingly are looking for a way to meet their targets um, but also support, you know, the industries that, are, that have captured them or, or donating to them. So what we're seeing with carbon credits in Australia, I think, is indicative of what you're going to see globally with with offsetting coming out of that voluntary domain into the regulatory sphere. So industry and governments can say, uh, we're meeting our Paris target, we're, we're on our way to net zero, but we're also supporting fossil fuel production and expansion too. Thank you. <laughs> The session is net zero and caramel removal, and just to be sweet because of the Rosa Shana, I think the presenters, the speakers said that they doubt about net zero and carbon removal. They doubt about net zero targets from the oil companies. We saw some scary message from the majors and also the word greenwashing, I think is the more frequent word here in this presentations and we have also the conflict of interests that maybe can undermine the approval of the regulation of the approval of the project. But let's start the round of questions. I have one, two and three. Yeah, I think the first one is here. Please identify yourself and show the I'm speaker. Hugh Lee. I work in the international coal industry. Um, I think we need to make it absolutely clear that the IEA last year said that no new fossil fuel project was compatible with net zero. The offsetting that's and CCS that will be used will be in addition to no new carbon and no new fossil fuel production. We need that offsetting and carbon credits for other things, not to uh, ameliorate in any way fossil fuel production. I wonder if the panel have any comments on that. So it's for the old panelists. So a new question. Yeah. I think here and then her, she. Uh, <coughs> yeah, so it's Mike Coffin from Carbon Tracker. Um, I had a question for Nadira around um, just a clarification on um, net zero projects there. It looked as though it was just scope one and two uh, emissions, the operational emissions, so that um, that the you were talking about in the presentation, as opposed to any of the end use emissions, eighty five percent of the problem. Um, can I just, could you? There's a quite direct question of, am I correct in that? Um, and the second follow up question would be, do we think it's then appropriate for anyone to say they're a net zero company if all they're doing is looking at scope one and two uh, emissions? Thank you. Thank you. Another question here in the front. I guess, I guess the question I want to ask you um, is, in your mind, what is the, what is the strategy? What is the missing thing that we're missing to expose this? Because I guess I'm feeling like I've sat at so many of these panels over the last five years, and read so many documents that 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 are clear that this is a sham. And 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 yet, you know, we we keep just having these kind of don't look up moments. I mean, Polly, your your presentation could easily have been made by someone in the UK or Norway or the US or Canada. These are the exact same arguments. And so there whether it is through the arguments around race to zero and the criteria, the GFINS criteria, the you know, the, the, the conversations that will happen at COP27 and are happening at COP26 or the conversations we're all experiencing if we come from those countries in the domestic forum, it is, you know, our governments are still approving more projects and they keep saying they're in line with net zero because of all this stuff. And the public wants to believe that there's a technological fix. And, and, I, 
And the thing that's really driving me nuts is even with Bex, one of you said Bex was the better, you know, the better system. I sat down with a group of scientists last week and I said, how, so, so in the modeling, we need, we need Bex the size of India, twice the size of India every year in order to make this global modeling work, right? That's what they tell us. So how much are we doing right now? And they said, zero. So we, we don't actually have successful Bex products, projects, but our, our, our plan globally to save the planet is somehow to do these massive scale Bex projects. So all of it is absurd and, use, and being used as a cover to stop, to, so we don't have absolute emissions and production decline. So why aren't we breaking through and how do we break through? Like, I just want your thoughts I, on that because you're all fun. working on it. And it just seems to me like that this is the place where we can have that conversation. So it's for all the speakers. Well, anyone who wants to. Yeah. So I skip here just because of time. I don't know if we're going to have time for the second round, please. Um, the first question for all the speakers. I don't know if someone wants to comment in the third question because this second question was just for Najir. So for the first question about the offsets and the role of the offsets, please. I don't know if all speakers want to comment or... I think you've made a really good point. Um, and the IPCC says the same thing that, you know, it's, we need carbon removal. Um, it's just that the industry ignores the bit where it says no new gas and coal and they cherry pick the information. So in their brochures, they say, or well, the IEA and the IPCC says we need removal and we need offsets. So we're actually in line with that best practice advice. It's not. It's, I know it's not an inadequate example uh, answer. Sorry, but I think it just shows that even putting that out there, even having something like offsets available, shows that industry will just game it at every available opportunity. So I agree entirely with what you're saying. Someone more wants to comment on that. Yeah. Happily chime in, you know, I, I, I think it's quite clear, the science is quite clear in terms of w what the world needs. And I think that the, the difficulty is, again, as we've been discussing, the, the dissonance between what's needed and what's happening on the ground today. Um, so, you know, I, I, again, you know, I just agree with those comments. Um, and I think, Mike, you, you raise a really excellent point, because, again, of course, the majority of the emissions are scope three. Um, but I was looking at it from the perspective of the approval process that governments face. So in terms of the scope of what they're approving, you know, quite often it's the upstream component. And in terms of that regulatory approval, uh, what's, what they have, uh, what their approval process covers is one and two. Um, primarily. If, however, they are doing uh, domestic use, then of course, scope three would come under that as well. So it depends very much in terms of what the project is and what the government approval is. You know, despite that, I would say, however, as part of a broader uh, conversation around the approval of those projects, the discussion around scope three should be included, uh, without a doubt, I think. Uh, but my remarks were very much in terms of the, the regulatory process uh, for the upstream component of it. Again, not, not diminishing that there are significant the lion's share of it is from scope three. So for the last question, just not being so pessimistic or optimistic, I don't know. We have one million tons CO2 per year of capture being from the ethanol industry in the USA. Just feel, it means nothing. And I think for this last question, maybe you three, you three can comment on that, please. Um, maybe I can just, uh, is this microphone on? Yeah, it's on, hi. So thanks for the questions. Um, so I think, yeah, that's uh, that kind of um, is a difficult uh, question to deal with about how, the, you know, What's been presented today has has been well known to many of us in the game, <laughs> um, and so how do we get this message out to the people that need to hear this? Um, in terms of offsets, and especially in um, the behaviour of the oil majors um, regarding offsets, I haven't seen many academics look at this actually. For me, it's been the media, especially Bloomberg, uh, the um, Wall Street Journal, and some um, 
uh, pretty influential uh, global media sources that have really focused on this, along with NGOs and think tanks. So as an academic, I've been a little bit embarrassed to think that my peers have missed this huge uh, development on, you know, the carbon major scene. Um, and we've been doing other more fashionable uh, uh, topics. And I think that offsets, like um, a lot of phase-out topics, it sort of um, is often felt that it's like an age topic. People have exhausted that. If you do that academically, it's not novel anymore. So I think anyway, that, yeah, definitely we need to have more academics looking at this topic. And then publishing a paper is obviously not enough. So um, I think um, when there's a relevant message that, has, that I think has value to society, then ideally then this will be communicated with the media. And um, I've got a few friends in the US that have spent a lot of time <laughs> developing strategies about how to get you know, research results across to the media. One of the simple things that I tried myself, I wasn't very successful, was make, um, what is it? Uh, a, it's um, a press release, and then you send it out to your contacts. And actually, so for the paper that we wrote that got um, attention, the our homemade <laughs> press release wasn't very successful. The one from the journal and from the university, that was the most successful. But anyway, we, we I think we should try as academics. But I think the media um, is definitely an, an, an ally. And I think um, I would just, yeah, I've got a lot of respect, I think, for the, um, the media and the um, the uh, think tanks that have been working on this topic well before I was. <laughs> I'm embarrassed that I didn't pick, the, uh, pick up on this earlier, this big sham, as you called it. Thanks. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, it's a good question. I'm uh, I, I, I'm optimistic on a few fronts and, and um, multiple strategies. I think one um, is certainly the rising tide of, of climate litigation um, to hold the major fossil fuel polluters accountable um, and not for for loss and, and damage, which, you know, just the notion of them actually internalizing the, the costs of the, doing business would really shift the, the calculus. Um, and also for for fraud, for deceiving their, their customers and investors. And I think, you know, this information that's coming out through a, a congressional investigation in the U.S., I think investigative journalism keeps turning stuff up. I, you know, at some point we may start to see, as we did with the tobacco industry, whistleblowers who, um, who, who to leak internal documents. I mean, a little bit of that in the recent um, in the recent uh, documentaries, but on BBC and Paramount Plus. So, um, you know, so we're we're working in concert with legal experts to help ensure that the physical and social science that's needed to inform that litigation is is advancing and and accessible. Um, I also think that that. Um, Making these, you know, these these companies that are that are lying in greenwashing pariahs, and that means isolating them from other parts of the business community. And you know, we, we just had a session about finance, right? So that that would serve the purpose not only of of cutting off financial flows, but actually, you know, making those that are that are continuing to fuel and finance fossil fuel expansion face the the consequences of what's happening. The PR industry is another important lever. I mean, they're creating these ad campaigns. So, um, you know, there's a lot of energy out there and and um, it, and I think figuring out ways that that we engage and and plug in with, you know, youth driven, indigenous led um, campaigning and use the the levers of of litigation and ultimately, you know, undercut the, the social license of these companies. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, I think, I think first question about, I think it's just, you were quite right. I, was, I think the IPCC and IAM like modern research showed like not achieving 1.5 degrees. I think the particular coal power plant with CCS is there's no price for that. And so, and then, but so I, I, I think we should be very clear, like there's no coal use even with, with, with CCS in the 1.5 degree uh, scenarios. But on the other hand, and I like now I am monitoring is heavily rely on the BEX, as you pointed out, and then BEX is, is, is pretty problematic because of the, you know, it's, it has a lot of trade off with, with biodiversity, food supplies and other things. So I think the rely on BEX is also, it's not necessary. It's not, I think it's a good idea as well. And um, then, so how, how, what is a, uh, like, you know, missing strategy? Yeah. Um, I don't have a very good answer for that. Um, but my sense is, I think we should, anyway, it's the reason why the fossil oil and gas, oil and gas companies is very, you know, strong. And it's because we still have a lot of huge demands on the, on liquid, for, like, and gas and fuel. And then 
in, in the demand sectors, particularly like in you know, the load transport and the buildings and spatial heatings. And we, I think they, they, we should just like you know, electrify everything as much as possible. And, and I think that's the way we should go ahead. I think mean, in some way it's a little bit contradictory because we are talking about how to reducing the production of the, the fossil fuel, but actually it's, it's, we need to think about the other side as well as well. So, so how we can reduce the demands of the fossil fuel. And I think electrifies like, you know, as many like, you know, like in the sector as possible is, is, it, is for me, is the right approach. And then that's why I think there are a lot of like optimisms around ILA in the US because that's the how we like in a lot of the governments like spending going to do these demand sectors and increasing like you know the clean energy supplies and and electrifies as many like you know the yeah it, like like the yeah infrastructures and then replacing like fossil fuel like you know equipment so I think that's the that's the strategy we need to like, see. I mean, but at the same time, I, we we couldn't ignore the like you know this like you know fuel driven electric using by by the fossil fuel industries. But I think that's not enough to to you know moving away from fossil fuel. I think we need to make material benefit like you know investment on how we can expand like clean energy and and electrify so electrification. So that's my answer. So we are in the time, sorry for the last question and thanks for the audience and for the speakers. Thank you very much.